Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. So Marty, we wouldn't be probably even having this discussion if it weren't for a case that has gained a lot of notoriety slash awareness over the past year and, and certainly in the past couple of months since the verdict on this trial. But let's assume that a lot of people aren't familiar with this case from Vanderbilt. Can you walk us through in detail the timeline of events? If my memory serves me correctly, this all took place in, was it 2017 or 2018? 2017. All right. So take us back to that fateful day in 2017. So this is an amazing story on so many different levels. Redonda Vaught is a 36-year-old nurse who was hired at Vanderbilt in 2015. Now, Christmas Eve 2017, she was taking care of a patient named Charlene Murphy, 75-year-old woman who was admitted for a subdural hematoma or a, a brain bleed, actually improved quickly. And two days later, she was ready to leave and they ordered, the doctors ordered sort of one last scan while she was in the hospital. The nurse, Redonda, took her to the scanner and ordered some Versed. There was some Versed ordered, which is a sedative to help people stay still during the scan. This was ordered in the ICU before she came down or who ordered the Versed? Presumably the physician who was caring for her. And the nurses will often say, look, can I have an open order for Versed if I need to use it in the CAT scanner? And every now and then the radiologist will order it while they're down there. They'll say, hey, this person's having trouble staying steady. Can we get a Versed order? I mean, how many times have you and I said yes to that request? So it's a commonly used medication in that scanner. She goes into a system, a relatively new system that's got automated dispensing. There have been many complaints that there are too many alerts and you often have to override the system because there was not good coordination between the electronic health records and the pharmacy. So in this system, you frequently had to override alerts. Well, she types in VE to order the Versed, and up comes, maybe through a default, Vecuronium, which is a paralyzing agent. It's a potent paralyzing agent and gives it to the patient. So just to be clear, so she's typing in VE, it auto-populates VEC, Vecuronium, instead of VER, Versed. She doesn't realize this. She clicks on it. What is this, like a little mobile Pixis device that she's traveling with? I'm assuming she's in the radiology suite when this happens, or is she doing this back in the ICU? I'm not sure the location, but it's clear that she typed in VE, Vecuronium comes out. Now, she had to override the alert. There was an alert, and the Vecuronium came up as a powder when most people would know Versed is a liquid. But there are other things that come up as powders, and you just have to inject some saline to suspend the powder. That was a warning flag. You know, we talk about the Swiss cheese model. She reportedly was distracted, and she suspends the powder into a solution. The cap should routinely... And by the way, just for folks to understand, why would Vecuronium even be there? It's really only something that can be used when a patient is either in surgery and they're fully anesthetized and on a ventilator or in the ICU under the same conditions. There's no other need for vecuronium other than in a patient who is on a ventilator. That's right. So presumably because this patient was in the ICU, I mean, because otherwise you shouldn't even have vecuronium in the Pixis system, right? That's right. And the cap routinely has on the cap emergency drug warning. It has a little warning on the cap. So there are a bunch of these sort of... And it had that? Did have that? It routinely has that I want to be very careful with my words. I didn't see documentation that that one had it, but it routinely has that as a standard thing. Now, she immediately, because this is a potent paralytic agent, paralyzed the patient and she died. Now, they were not in the ICU to immediately resuscitate the patient. It's a tragedy. The woman was 75, otherwise going to go home. Vanderbilt had documentation where two neurologists listed the cause of death as basically the brain bleed. And it was deemed essentially a natural cause of death. This was reported to the medical examiner. And it How is that even possible? The woman was presumably wide awake when she went down to have one more scan before leaving the hospital. 
That's right. She dies on the scanner, and the cause of death was stated as cerebral hemorrhage or subdural hematoma? That's right. So the family was told what? She just died on the scanner? The family has been gagged and basically is not speaking about the case, although one family member told the media that they want to see the maximum penalty to her, and the grandson said that the woman who died would have forgiven the nurse. Now, the nurse immediately feels horrible, says exactly what she did, recognized her mistake as the patient was deteriorating, felt this, I may have caused this, and admitted, reported this whole thing was 100% honest. I mean, in an incredible way, has even said subsequently that her life will never be the same, that she feels that a piece of her has died. I think we've all been a part of medical mistakes where we still think about that. The medical examiner does not investigate the case because the report is a brain bleed. So in other words, the death certificate, which is usually filled out at that moment. Let's walk people through how this works, Marty, because again, you and I take this for granted because we've done it a thousand times. I don't think people understand how this works. So this woman stops breathing in the MRI scanner. Or I assume it was an MRI, not a CT, if they were trying to paralyze her or trying to sedate her, but whatever it was. So they declare her dead there, or maybe they would take her up to the ICU and try to resuscitate her further. But certainly within minutes, she's going to be declared dead. Do we know if they intubated her and kept her alive for a little while longer until they declared her brain dead? I don't know the timing of the death, but they attempted a full resuscitation, right? You would, as soon as you recognize this, anybody who's recognized to be unresponsive like this and desaturating would immediately be resuscitated. The point is at some point when they cease to resuscitate her and or when they declare end of life, usually a resident fills out a death certificate at that point. Now, I don't know how many of those things I've filled out in my life, but it's a very painful process. (laughs) Nobody wants to do it. No, no, no. Nobody wants to be the one to have to sign the death certificate and fill it out. And you have to be very careful in what you write on it because it wants a primary cause of death, a secondary cause of death, and you have to write on the right line. And it has to be, I remember it has to be, I don't know, maybe this is done electronically now, but certainly at the time I remember having to redo many of these things. They get sent back to me for months and months and months until I got it just right. But somebody had to write on that death certificate, subdural hematoma as the proximate cause of death. Well, two Vanderbilt neurologists issued this report, and this came up later. The medical examiner, down the road, two years later, changes the cause of death to accidental. They get tipped off. By whom? By a a report that comes out. So it'll be clear here as I progress. Basically, within a month, Vanderbilt, this is per investigative reporting by the Tennessean, quote unquote, the Tennessean reports that Vanderbilt takes several actions to obscure the fatal error from the public. Okay, it was not reported to state or federal officials. That's required by law. You've got to report it to the state and you've got to report it to CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, was not done. Report any death or any death that is deemed accidental? Any what we call sentinel event, which is clearly a a preventable adverse event related death. It will be referred to as a sentinel event. They've got to be reported. Not reported to the Joint Commission. You could argue that's an accrediting body. It's private. You can break their rules. It's not a violation of the law. But Vanderbilt basically takes these actions to hide or obscure the error, according to the Tennessean, from their investigation. They fire the nurse. And Vanderbilt- This is two years after. No, this is a month after. Oh, a month after. Okay. Vanderbilt immediately- negotiates an out-of-court settlement with the family, gags the family from saying anything about it. Everybody is gagged in the family except for the grandson who was legally not included in the gagging. He ends up speaking up later. The hospital, when they're asked subsequently about the case, say, oh, we can't discuss it because of this legal settlement that we have. By the way, they don't say anything publicly. Fast forward a couple months. So just to make sure I understand, we're a month after this woman dies. The death certificate and the neurologists all agree she died of a subdural hematoma, but clearly the family has been told the truth, which is why they're receiving a large settlement and asked to sign a gag order, and the nurse is being fired. That's right. The nurse 
Redonda Vaught gets a job at another hospital as a bed coordinator, which all hospitals have bed coordinators. It's a hospital called Centennial in Nashville. And then you go all the way to the fall in October. Remember, this happened Christmas Eve, so you're almost a year out. An anonymous person reports to the state and CMS that there was an unreported medical error. Okay, they basically got tipped off by some whistleblower who's anonymous. Then the Tennessee Health Department, which is tipped off, formally states that they're deciding not to pursue any action on this tip off. The agency actually said in a letter that the event did not constitute a violation and therefore they're not going to do anything. Now, just as an interesting side note, many of these state medical boards are basically sleepy organizations. If you know the story of Dr. Death, tell the story. Neurosurgeon in Texas, multiple horrific catastrophic outcomes, all believed to be sentinel events, catastrophic, avoidable medical mistakes, negligence, and people dying in his practice over many years, documented by Laurel Beal in this famous podcast. Maybe at one point it was the most popular single podcast in the entire world of podcasting titled Dr. Death. And basically everyone knew of this doctor's problems. The residency program knew, but they just graduated him to sort of get rid of him. He had problems at numerous hospitals. Nobody would say anything. And this kind of speaks to this problem of the old culture of patient safety. Finally, there's something so egregious that happens that he gets arrested and goes to jail. Now the state medical board didn't want to touch it for the longest time. So that's typical of state medical boards. They generally don't want to touch anything. Now, ironically, you can be Dr. Death and kill people and they don't touch it. But if you prescribe ivermectin, all of heaven and earth is coming down on you. Now, I don't believe ivermectin has any activity against COVID. I should just state that. But it has no downside. And I don't recommend it. I'm not. But I mean, right now, they're going after people with who prescribe ivermectin with warnings, and they want your hide if you prescribe ivermectin. Just an irony. So they basically say that she does not violate the statutes and or the rules governing the profession. They put out a statement, Tennessee Department of Health. This is late 2018. Yep. This is almost a year after the event. And can you imagine what she's thinking? Like, you just want it to be over. Things are escalating. Did she ever speak to the family? Was she permitted to apologize to the family? She was under orders by Vanderbilt never to speak to the family, but she had said through the media several times that she takes full responsibility. She even said in her trial that she was 100% at fault. I mean, she was, I think, beating herself up over something that was probably a combination of her mistake and a system, but I'll leave my commentary out of this. So CMS starts investigating. Medicare, when they send, they take this seriously, this whistleblower complaint, they do a surprise investigation at Vanderbilt. End of October, early November, they spend about a week investigating Vanderbilt. They are pissed. Vanderbilt clearly did not report this, clearly a violation. And they get so serious about this, they basically conclude that the medical error was not reported in violation of their rules, and they threaten all Medicare payments to the institutions, to Vanderbilt. They are serious. And that's when this becomes public, about a year after the event, because Vanderbilt would not discuss it, but a journalist was able to get a hold of this report from Medicare because it's a public document, it's public agency. Did they have to request a FOA or did they just get it on their own. That was not through a FOIA. That was public information, but no names were in there. So Redonda Voigt is still basically not a name in the United States at this point. Now, CMS told Vanderbilt, if you cannot show that you have taken system-wide actions to prevent this in the future, we are going to suspend all Medicare payments to Vanderbilt University Medical Center. If you talk about a threat, it's maybe the biggest threat in healthcare in the modern era. Vanderbilt give CMS a so-called plan of correction. You know, here's what we're doing. We're taking this seriously. And they don't release that to the public. A journalist then got that plan of correction through a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act request. Try to get it from Vanderbilt directly, but they were denied. 
Then on February 19th, the name Redonda Vaught became public information when she was arrested for reckless homicide and impairment abusing an adult. Now, that's when people found out about what happened. Just to make sure I understand that. She was arrested. She was arrested. Tell me how that happened. So a DA saw the case and said, we're going to press charges. That's right. The district attorney in Davidson County basically said, we're going to go after her. Let's stop there for a second. How often does that happen that a medical mistake happens and a district attorney presses criminal charges against the doctor or the nurse or technician or whoever is involved? I have been in this field of patient safety my entire career. I've never heard of it with a nurse. I have heard of outright fraud resulting in arrests. For example, the doctor death story. There was a doctor in Michigan who was giving chemotherapy to people who didn't have cancer. I mean, that's sort of cold-blooded fraud. If you exclude two types of errors, if you exclude fraud, so all financial crimes that are fraud, and if you include like doctors who are raping patients where they're just breaking the law, I'm talking about a medical error that was not made deliberately. Never heard of it. Never heard of an arrest for an honest medical mistake. And in fact, one of the principles of patient safety that we have been advocating throughout the entire 25, 23 years of the patient safety movement in America has been the concept of just culture, which is a doctrine which says that honest mistakes should not be penalized. They should be penalized if there was malintent or substance abuse or somebody should be suspended from their role if they are an ongoing threat. But honest mistakes should not be penalized, and that is a doctrine that has enabled people to speak up about this epidemic of medical mistakes in the United States. And that has been celebrated as the sort of giant milestone of the American patient safety movement, and it's a worldwide concept. I've traveled the world, and people believe in the just culture doctrine. The arrest of Redonda Voigt undid in my opinion, 23 years of advancement in patient safety, it undermined the very fundamental doctrine of just culture. She was arrested. By the way, she had the entire time in documents that subsequently came out, immediately admitted what happened at the moment this woman died and throughout and ever since and to this day. And I've had a recent interaction with her. I can touch on that. But basically, the victim's family, one of the members of the family, had basically said the patient would have forgiven her. So the trial started when? Right now, we're about a year after. But because of COVID, the trial doesn't start until... I think it was like this past fall, right? Three months ago, March 21st to 25th, about a four-day period. So in the interim, there was a meeting of the Tennessee Board of Licensure, basically the Department of Health. Remember, they had said they're not going to pursue this. They then flip the executive at Vanderbilt University, C. Wright Pinson, who's actually a pancreatic biliary surgeon, I know him. He sort of admits to this board that looks into Vanderbilt and says, yes, the death was not reported, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, and that our response at Vanderbilt was too limited. Now, at this point, Redonda Vaught is getting a lot of national attention and she's got big legal bills and she goes on a GoFundMe campaign, raises over $100,000. And basically says in the GoFundMe campaign that, look, she made a mistake and she needs legal costs. I mean, this woman could not have been more honest about what happened. Also, around that time, nurses nationwide take notice. There's millions of nurses in the United States. They start getting very emotionally connected to this. They start showing up at some of these hearings in front of the Department of Health and they say, I am Redonda. That becomes a slogan that nurses around the country take on. They put it on social media. They stand outside, hundreds of them, around the time of her trial with signs, I am Redonda. Basically saying what you and I were saying, it's every doctor, every nurse I talked to, I was talking with Zubin Dabani, same reaction. I see exactly what may have happened. Gosh, that could have been me. I mean, look at the study from Mayo Clinic. 10.5% of people admit to a major medical mistake in the last three months, people reconnect with Redonda Vaught. Several dozen people 
are out at every appearance. She makes her court plea in February of 2019, just about a year after the incident, a year and a month. She pleads not guilty. Now, her lawyers argue that Vanderbilt shares part of the blame. Now, several months later, the Tennessee Department of Health, which said they're not going to pursue action against her, they flip. They reverse their position and they go after her. And they use the argument that they must immediately investigate what they describe as a threat to the public. Her lawyer, knowing that they're going to go to trial for the criminal case for murder, for homicide, he asks the judge to postpone the Tennessee Department of Health hearing because he sees... Wait, I'm sorry, Marty. I just missed something. I don't think I was paying attention. This was homicide, not manslaughter? Homicide. This is homicide. Reckless homicide and abuse. Now, she has two hearings and for two legal proceedings ahead of her about a year after the incident, a year and a half out. She's got the Tennessee Health Board and she's got the criminal case to go. So her lawyer says, look, Tennessee Health Board, they're acting like a bunch of clowns. I'm paraphrasing. They said they're not going to take any action. And then over a year later, they suddenly reverse their position. What's going on? So he makes this argument. And the Tennessee Department of Health says, very fishy, they say, no, we must do this immediately. We cannot postpone it till after the criminal trial because she may pose an, quote unquote, urgent threat to the public. I can't believe what you're hearing here. The administrative judge, Elizabeth Cameron, decides not to delay her Department of Health hearing, and it goes ahead of her criminal hearing. And she ends up going in front of this board. At the same time, Vanderbilt is just hanging out, arguing they can't say anything about the case. This Tennessee investigation says that they've obscured the circumstances of her death. And this grandson is so frustrated, he makes a statement around then that says that Vanderbilt is engaged. And remember, he's not under the gag order. He says, quote unquote, that there's a cover-up that screams. There's a cover-up that screams. COVID comes, hits this country. If you haven't remembered, that's a coronavirus that (laughs) resulted in two pandemics, a tragic pandemic which killed about a million Americans, and then a subsequent pandemic that followed called a pandemic of lunacy. But in July, finally, they get their trial. The first one is the Department of Health. She says at the Department of Health hearing, this is completely my fault. Her license is revoked even though the board says things that we would sympathize with. They say, the vice chair of the board says, we all make mistakes. And there have been many mistakes and failures in this case, suggesting basically that Vanderbilt has part of the blame. But they say, our role is just to evaluate the role of the nurse here, and they revoke her license. Kind of ridiculous what their statements are. Then three months ago, it goes to the criminal trial, and the Davidson... County DA, Glenn Funk, has his three assistant DAs go to the mat in court, and they aggressively and viciously went after her. These three assistant DAs, Debbie Household, Chad Jackson, and Brittany Flat, recently became assistant DAs. It's kind of a new job for them. And they go viciously after her and argue that there was negligent homicide. Now, She does everything she can to try to defend herself. Now, what's their argument? Their argument is this was such an egregious error. I guess I'm just trying to understand how this is homicide. Maybe I just don't understand the law well enough. But if you kill somebody while you're driving, let's assume you're not under the influence of alcohol or anything like that, and you're not driving recklessly, you're driving safely and you kill a cyclist. I'm not aware of a driver in that situation having. I certainly know this was the case in California when I lived there, but I know that there was no instance in which a driver who killed a cyclist faced criminal charges unless there was reckless behavior involved or alcohol. So what rises to the level of even manslaughter, vehicular manslaughter is presumably what? Is that when you're driving recklessly and another person dies as a result of it? Like, I guess I'm just trying to understand what the DA's argument was here legally and then separately politically. I don't know if you can speak to either of those, of course. These are broader questions. Those are the same questions I had. I'll tell you what I know, and that is that 
She was charged with, quote unquote, negligent homicide and abuse of an impaired adult and found guilty of both of those charges. Now, in the arguments that they made, they had cited 10 mistakes that she had made. And it was kind of the Swiss cheese model that we had talked about with patient safety. This is the perfect storm, if you will. It was, she was distracted. She overrode the warning alert, even though nurses at that hospital say that they do that every day. Nurses said every day they override alerts, that it was a powder and not a liquid, that the cap should have said it was a paralyzing agent. There's so many things that they point to that you can frame somebody, you can make somebody look like they are doing something that is, can you imagine if they had the insights that we have at our M&M conference, it would just look really bad on the outside. They did everything they could to paint. These are aggressive young lawyers. Now, Glenn Funk, who's the DA, who was getting a lot of attention around this time because this is his office that is bringing the charges against a Vanderbilt nurse for a medical mistake that was an honest mistake that she admitted to immediately. He had two other VAs who were running against him condemn this saying, you know, this is a farce. What's going on? Something is fishy here. There are rumors, conspiracy theories in Nashville that maybe there was some entity behind this oddly aggressive action against this nurse, a competing health system, Vanderbilt University itself to bring tension away from its error and not reporting and other errors related to this case. I don't know. I have no opinion on any of those, but those are definitely circulating ideas because to have a DA so aggressively go after a nurse for an honest mistake with such a significant charge, it is odd. It is odd. Now, she was found guilty and sentenced very recently. And in the sentencing, she was convicted of homicide. That's right. Found guilty, negligent homicide. And in the sentencing, what was the possible range of sentences she could receive? I know what the sentence was, and we'll talk about that. But coming out of the trial, what was the potential? The judge had considered three years of jail time. But of course, the judge could have said whatever the judge wanted to say. They could have said 20 years or a lifetime. Negligent homicide is not something where I think there's a ceiling on how many years you can give somebody. Did legal experts have a point of view on what was expected? I've not heard any experts comment on what was expected. I think at every stage in this entire case, people expected the thing to end. The DA would say, she's been through the ringer now. We're going to basically slap her on the wrist and do a settlement or something like that. Never happened. And so as this grows, nurses around the country are finding they connect with her. A bunch of letters that came out just after the sentencing. After the sentencing or after the conviction? After the sentencing. Okay, let's tell people what the sentence was. So the judge was merciful to give her three years of probation, and so there'll be no jail time for her. But she's a convicted felon for the rest of her life. Well, not for the rest of her life because she got something called judicial diversion, which means that they can expunge her criminal record if she serves the probationary period on good behavior. So, you know, an act of mercy from God there. And God, I'm not referring to the judge, I'm referring to, you know. So the prosecution, I'm sure, was very upset with that sentence. It sort of undermined a lot of their efforts. Yep. Here is what one Vanderbilt physician, you know, these letters of support started coming out of the public. Here's what a Vanderbilt physician wrote. And I think this Vanderbilt physician speaks for many of us. He said, we cared, referring to the nurse that he worked with, Redonda Voigt, we cared for so many patients together. What was notable, what was the consistent high level of attention I saw to her to provide to so many of our patients and their families when we worked together, she was very conscientious and aptly cared for many complex patients. All these letters of support of people she worked with at Vanderbilt come out. Lots of Vanderbilt physicians pissed off at what's happening. They're not happy that their impeccable medical care is getting characterized nationally by the actions of their administration. Here's what the DA's office did in response to these letters that were released. They released this letter. I am sickened by those who rallied around her as a hero. I thought she was a horrible anomaly, but now I think there are hundreds of thousands of nurses who must also be dangerous practitioners 
since they defended the indefensible so readily. That was Lisa Bergelko. She is an assistant professor at Newman University. She wrote that letter in support of the DA's prosecution, and the DA put that letter out in the public domain almost as a... And who is this professor? She's a professor of what? She's a professor of nursing. I see. She's a nurse herself. So this is the saga that we live with now. And in my opinion, we have had decades of progress in patient safety, about 23 healthy years of significant improvements in the culture of safety and the way we approach safety, undone with a single group of assistant young district attorneys that decide to go after one individual at the exclusion of doing anything about a hospital that, unlike the nurse, did not admit to anything initially and broke the law. (laughs) 